Jesse, it's time to write. Okay, yo. Yeah, it's fun fiction, bitch. Welcome to Fun Fiction, ladies and gentlemen, the show about movies, media, and how the internet ruins it. I am your host, Scotty Moore, and this week I am joined by the man you know him, you love him, from Trending Lemon, Night Attack, and elsewhere, Bryce Castillo! (laughs) Hello! Hey, Scotty, how's it going, man? What's up, man? It's fair. I, is it bad? I was practicing that in the car earlier, and I realized my my turns into blue from Blue's Clues very quickly. <laughs> so we, uh, I brought you on to talk about a show that's essentially the opposite of Blue's Clues, basically. <laughs> yeah. And that is uh, Breaking Bad, which is a show I had never seen before. It and... blew my mind when we were talking about this, and you told me you hadn't watched any of it. I mean, I know it's not it's not something for everybody, right? It's like kind of a hardcore sort of action drama, but I kind of thought it would be right up your alley. I was really oh, surprised. Oh, no, no. It, it is right up my alley. Like, that. the reason I started this show was to watch TV. Because, like, I don't watch TV outside of, like, having a reason to. So I'm like, if I start a podcast where I have to watch TV, ah. I'll be good. Um, but, yeah, I had watched the pilot of it a long time ago. Because I'll go through these periods where I won't have a show I can watch. And I will sit down and watch, like five pilots in a row for TV shows and pick my favorite of those and then keep going with the show. And I remember being very interesting Breaking Bad, but I think that was also the same time I watched the first episode of Supernatural. And I'm sorry, I will always pick oh, Dean. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and if that's if that's the, the path that you took, that is a long and winding road. <laughs> it was a very arduous path, <laughs> yes. But uh, wh- why did you choose to bring Breaking Bad to the table for it? Uh, it might be, it's certainly one of my favorite shows of all time, and I don't think it would be controversial controversial to list it as possibly one of the best television shows, full stop, of all time, of the medium. Um, and the the other thing was when, you know, when, when you were telling me about the concept of the show about, about kind of being about fan fiction, which is something that, you know, I've, I've engaged with a lot, um... Breaking Bad is not a show I would have thought of in those terms, right? Like I have, I have a different, I have a different type of affection for the characters of Breaking Bad, not in this way. And so it was an interesting, it was a, it was a fun exercise to really kind of dive down into this rabbit hole. Uh, and so oh, yeah. that that kind of was was my thinking on it. My, my once I started this show, I realized you can find fan fiction for anything. Yep. It's like you know that musical you saw that no one knows about. Yeah, there's fan fiction for that. I don't know how it exists, but it's there. Yeah. Um, I, I will say to start things off, a car- every time I watch a show, I kind of go in with preconceived notions about how characters should be, and it always blows my mind at how wrong I was. Oh, really? And and the character on this show that I I. I thought was going to be he is who I thought he is, but he's also so much more is Jesse. Mm-hmm. Especially because I I only got to go through season one, and Jesse is such. I thought he was almost like a secondary. Like I know he's the sidekick, but I thought he was going to be more of a goofy character. But there's such an emotional arc to Jesse that I almost consider him at least through season one the most likable character in the show well and that's a that's uh uh i don't know how well known the story is but i originally jesse was just going to be a kind of ancillary character and because he was so well beloved in season one he sort of became a permanent you know number two a permanent b plots a lot of the time but a a you know regular character versus someone they probably would have just killed off early in season two. right well, well see with me it, there was like one quote he had that was the most telling to who he is as a character because going into it i'm like because he's introduced as like captain cook like the best meth dude of all time and i'm sitting back like oh so he is a, like a legit player in the game and then after they kill the two I, i'm sorry i can't remember their names the two drug dealers at the beginning of the season right 
And Walt's saying, like, well, who do you know that distributes? He goes, oh, the guy we killed. Okay, <laughs> yeah. well, how'd you, how'd you get introduced to him? The other guy we <laughs> killed. I knew him right. in third grade. Meaning that Jesse's just been, like, thrown into this world. And you could tell he wants to get, get out of it. Because there's that whole episode where he goes back to his parents' house and finds out that, like, oh, no, my parents do care about me and all that. And you could see he's trying to make his life better. It, it's almost like the story at some point becomes about Jesse and Walt is just like an agent of chaos in his life trying to bring him back. I, oh man, so I've seen I've seen all five seasons uh, multiple right. times at this point. So I'm going to say, if you continue watching Breaking Bad, which I think it sounds like you probably will, uh, remember the thing that you just said. Remember <laughs> all of that because I think that's very succinct. I think that's a very succinct way of looking at both their their dynamic and and both of the personalities that uh, are kind of imparted upon the the illegal drug scene of Albuquerque, mm-hmm. New Mexico. Oh yeah. Oh, well, speaking of like, this made me laugh harder than I could than I thought I would about it. But the fact that this show that is about cooking meth and which. I don't know if I have a hierarchy of drugs, but I'd say meth is up there on probably worst. Sure. Um, The one scapegoat the show keeps going back to in the first season is weed. And they're just like, how dare you have this one joint in your room? It's like, right. okay. That, that, that's like the big like linchpin of uh, Jesse's, Jesse's episode when he goes to his parents' house. It's like, weed? You brought weed? And, and if anybody knew any better, you know, that it would be... It, it would be nothing, and yeah, the fact that this this is supposed to take place, I believe, in in oh geez, the the early aughts, right? Like not even close to to modern day, yeah, uh, yeah. is is also like d- that kind of double reinforces kind of how flip they are about weed in in the grand scale. Yeah, yeah. well, not only that, it's also like the same thing happened with Walt, where it's just like. I believe one of his exact quotes was just like, you told her I sold you weed? Well, I preferred it to the alternative of telling that that I've murdered men and cooking meth. Yeah. (laughs) And yet she still gets so upset that her husband is doing weed. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really great show about lying to everybody for, (laughs) for different reasons. Yeah. Um, I, 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 we, we should just talk off of the podcast once you finish watching it. Um, because I, because I think as it was coming out, everyone had very strong opinions about different characters throughout the show. Right. Um, and I, I would want to hear kind of what your take is on it because I think some characters don't get a fair shake or certainly didn't get a fair shake at the time. And I think you can still look at them and say, like, oh, that person's kind of being a jerk when, I think a lot of them are acting realistic-ish. I mean, there's always it's TV writing, yeah. right? But well, that's that's one of the notes that I wrote down is the fact that it's such every character is well rounded to where you can pick and choose your favorite character and your least favorite character. Like mm-hmm. for me, it's fucking Hank. Hank is the worst <laughs> character. But even then, even then, there are scenes where he's like, I really want to take my brother out for a ride along. And he takes Jesse, or not Jesse, he takes Walt out. Walter, yeah. Tr- trying to be good to him. And then he takes Walter Jr. out and is like, I feel in my heart that marijuana is bad. I'm trying to keep this kid off the streets. So it's like, he's a good person. He's just the worst person. <laughs> yeah, it's... Oh man, we have to talk. Okay, I I'm I'm trying to I tried to uh, 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 remember where se- season one ends in the junkyard, right? At that big junkyard scene. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm trying I'm trying not to jump ahead of you because I, I there are the the places that that show goes and the scale that that show goes up to is is really good. And the worst thing I want to the last thing I want to do is tip anything that's coming up. But it, oh, I'm bad about that. I'm bad about like if I'm watching a show, just being like. I wonder what happens with this character and then Googling it and being like, okay. Like, uh, yeah. I went to see Captain Marvel and the night before I Googled the spoilers and it still didn't. <laughs> I'm not a person who spoilers ruin the experience that much for me because I, yeah. I kind of like it more because I can see the clues as it leads up to it. Yeah, it's uh, – there, uh, there are certainly films – I mean, 
I tend to want to avoid spoilers just because I've had really good experiences going into, into stuff blind. But mm-hmm. I also n- know that I also really enjoy films that I choose to see a second time or TV shows that I choose to see a second time because I know the broad strokes of what's happening and I can really focus in more on the writing, on the dialogue, on mm-hmm. the way that they pace stuff out, the way that they they move the plot forward. Um so I, I, I tend to just be uh, spoiler clean. I try to be just clean about it. Maybe not totally spoiler free. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a movie that I'm going to go see like right after we're recording this. And, I'm, and all of the reviews are starting to come out for it. And I, I'm trying to avoid everything because I hear it's great. <laughs> and so, see, yeah. It's, it, yeah. Spoilers are one of those things that I am very much like, no, I don't need spoilers. I can still enjoy the movie. And then I still I go see Into the Spider-Verse. And then fucking um, Dr. Octopus's claw comes out. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a great. That's a really great moment. That's a really mm-hmm. fucking good moment in that movie. Oh, oh no, God. like, I, I went to see it again recently, and I, this is not a Spider-Verse episode, but still, they did, like, so many things leading up to it to mm-hmm. prevent you from ever suspecting that she's Dr. Octopus. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, when, when I, uh, Pete... Yeah. When Peter runs into the classroom, uh, he runs in front of the TV, and as soon as he does, he blocks her name. He, he blocks, blocks name. Octavius. And yeah. then earlier when it shows Spider-Man fighting Doc Ock, all you see is the claw. You do not see who the claw belongs to. Oh, it's so know. well done. I, when I went to go see Into the Spider-Verse, uh, and I, I, this is the last thing I'll say about it, uh, is mm-hmm. uh, there was uh, they pulled the fire. The fire alarm had gone off in the movie theater, like no. tw- twenty or thirty minutes into the film. So after that scene with um, uh, w- with him blocking the video, and so going back and and kind of watching through that scene again, it, it gave me the chance to like be a little more like, oh yeah, what is uh, they're uh, they're trying? What are they trying to hide here? And that was it was such a, a unique experience because I don't think anybody tends to have that like watching the first thirty minutes of something twice right. before they see the whole thing all the way through once. Uh, but yeah, man, that that movie is a masterpiece. I mean, Jesus! Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Anyways, meth, meth. Uh, I, one of my other favorite things about this this show is how good of an allegory. Because like, as a person who's Life is about to change a lot because I've got a baby on the way. Congrats. Thank you. It's such a good allegory for any of those weird existential crises we go through in life where you go kind of crazy. Because, like, when they say, oh, yeah, Walt's having him a midlife crisis, isn't he? He's not, but he is. (laughs) He 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 is. Like, it's... he. It, it, it's it's two things happening at once, right? I mean, I, and in some respect, it's a perfect storm because he probably is about the age to be having a midlife crisis, and thankfully, the show is at a point where you know they can actually lean into that a little bit. But also, yeah. he's in a tough situation, right? He's got a, a new baby he, with with a son who has special needs, and and it it's tough. It's tough to do that on you know a teacher's salary, and right. your wife is is staying at home. That's that's not. That that math doesn't always add up, and and with with all that, you know, the little bits that we see into his his life as a teacher, where you know the students don't really care, yeah. And which I hate, I hate that. Can I just say because he is an amazing teacher. Every time he has to talk about something, you could tell he's really passionate and enthralling, and the kids are just being assholes about it, and I'm so mad. He's passionate, but he's not charismatic. I think. I think something that comes out of the show is his anger. Like I think we oh, yeah. we, we we see his energy being put into you know his, his meth business and empire, um, and I think we forget that that person has to live in real life, and that person did live an entire life in real life, and mm. some of that a- energy and that anger comes out. You know, yeah. Uh, it, well, I mean, it comes from like because I, I think when they had their little basically intervention for him, he says it. He's just like, I feel like I've never had a choice in my life. Nothing mm-hmm. I've ever done feels like I ever got to choose it myself. And like when you get that pent up for thirty years, it comes out, and it comes out in a big way with Walter. Yeah, and man, that intervention scene is so great, partially because of that monologue, but also how receptive it is to 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 hank hank and uh uh 
Walt Jr. of just like, no, you know, that's kind of, or no, Walt Jr. is, is against it. But he, he makes a very convincing point of like, well, you know, I can be stuck in a bed trying to fight this or we can just like really try to make the most of it. And yeah. and it it's probably the most telling of Hank's character of all time because while everyone else is being straightforward, he's just like, all right, kiddo, you're at the bat. And you've got a broken arm, but you can let the pinch hitter hit, or you can strike out and lose the game. And Walt's just staring at him like, I've never seen a f- sport game in my entire life. What are you talking about? Um, I, one thing, okay, so one thing about the other seasons, and I don't remember how much the first season leans into this, but there's a lot of really strong um, visual decisions, cinematography decisions in Breaking Bad, especially by the end of it, where... They are really leaning into a lot of the landscape photography that they do. Oh yeah, a lot of the unique photography that uh, they they do with different devices. And uh, there's a scene, there's a really great scene near the end where a barrel is being rolled, and you just see it from the point of view of the barrel, and it's this like nauseating rotating mm-hmm. shot until it like falls out of this truck. Yeah. Um, it, it, is there much of that in this first season? I don't remember. It- it's very well shot. Like, that's one thing I said about it. This show seems extremely polished. But also, uh, speaking of rolling a barrel, this, the maddest I think I ever saw my partner get is when they're trying to get, they're getting the barrel of, it's methylamine, isn't it, that they're right. stealing? Yeah. They're getting the barrel of methylamine, and Jesse's got it by one side, and Walt's got it by one, and they're just, like, pigeon-walking it, and yeah. she's just staring, like, why are you not rolling it? <laughs> just roll it! Um, oh, but, gosh, no, yeah. going back to the intervention scene, and another scene that I found probably to be the biggest hook that kept me in the show. Cause like episode two is good, but mm. episode three finally got its claws in with what I described to be like the most enthralling, probably 15 minutes of TV. And it's where Walt goes down to the basement to basically try to negotiate like, Hey, why should I not kill you? Why should I kill you? And they just have this right. genuine human conversation that is so nice and so sweet for about 10 minutes of it. And then you see Walt go back upstairs and pull the broken plate out of the trash can and realize, like, oh, wait a minute. Everything he's just said is bullshit to me. He's about to try to kill me. It's the probably the first moment this show introduces the always be watching your fucking back dichotomy. Yeah, I think that whole the whole like we got this guy tied up in in the basement feels long it feels i i i remember it feeling torturous but but you're right like this is walt realizing no you are now in the drug game this is a ruthless uh, situation that's required of you you need to handle it and even if you are dealing with someone who grew up in the same town and shopped at the same stores as you and you can relate and empathize to that's only going to make it more difficult to to deal with the path that you've decided to go down it's and then the actual execution is is brutal it is as brutal as as all of the 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 time leading up to it the agonizing of it Mm -hmm. leading up it is it's probably one of the slowest deaths on the show I, it's I, I a think. painfully slow and not only that they added in the him getting stabbed in like the um calf just mm-hmm. to make it even more painful for the person at home yeah like it, it it was painfully slow but it was so enthralling to me because like even the guy even says just like hey well this is not this is not the career for you. You're not the kind of guy for this. And this is the scene where Walt has to prove, no, I'm the guy for this. This is kind of and I also feel like this is – that's the scene where Walt's character definitely evolved because before then, he seemed a whole lot less in control. Um, hmm. Because, like, even when he quits the car wash in the opening scene, he's just like, fuck you! And he's just, like, he's frantically – throwing all the, the, yes. the fresheners around, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but it's just when Walt lets his true anger come out that, like – 
you get really dope things happening. Like when he, um, I'm trying to remember the example from the first, oh, the first episode when the kids are making fun of Walt Jr. Walt just comes in, busts this kid's leg up, and then just goes, you got trouble walking, and then leaves. Those yes. are the moments that, those are the moments that I love where you get to see Walt's progression into getting that confidence of being able to, of making choices for himself. Yeah. Uh, and it, that evolution of, of who Walt is over time, over the rest of the show, um, really bears out. I mean, you see what the the person you know in this first season becomes because directly because of, of these actions. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a good show. This is a good show. Yeah. Well, I mean, it does go. <laughs> it goes up to the scene that I basically. It's the birth of Heisenberg, where mm. Jesse once again. Like I said before, it's just kind of like this scared little boy who, when he had to try to make a d- drug deal with this tough kingpin, flopped it and got his ass beat. Meanwhile, Walt, who is just buck fucking crazy at this point, walks in and is like, hey, this isn't meth. Boom. Blows up his entire operation. And then just goes, give me the fucking money. I want all of it. Like, he takes no prisoners, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and And that... That sort of, I don't know, that that gap between Walter and Jesse is 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 not as pronounced in this first season as as it becomes. But you you definitely see both of them rub off on each other. Yeah, and yeah. and and uh, kind of both ways, right? Because Walt comes to Jesse to say, "Hey, get me into this," and then eventually Walt is the take charge kick ass guy and Jesse is leans even more into being a meth cook and, and you know, yeah. ha- having pride in, in this thing. Oh yeah. Well, there was the scene where Jesse is out in the, out in the RV cooking with the, the sign spinner guy and picks up the crystal and goes, shouldn't be cloudy. No, fuck this. And just tosses the entire out. meth out. Yeah. yeah. Well, not, yeah, not only that, like, he's going through and be like, this is an Erlenmeyer flask. This is this kind of flask. This is a boiling flask. Like, mm-hmm. how clearly he's learning and you see Walt rubbing off on him. Is that, that's the first moment where I was just like, oh, I got this all Walt wrong. Jesse's the redeemable character, at least as of right now. And Walt's the terrible person. Yeah. That, you know, uh, it really becomes a show about craftsmen. I mean, they, it, it is kind of set in no uncertain terms later in the show, uh, with a sequence about, um, uh, a box that Jesse made in high school. Um, mm-hmm. but this really is about two men who are, uh, deadly dedicated to their craft. Their craft just happens to be highly yeah. illegal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it's really charming in that aspect, almost, of just, like, Jesse, even after he realizes, like, I, I feel like there's another element to it where Walter, like, Walter can make that pure meth without even doing any of the so-called art that Jesse likes to talk about. Mm. And as an artist, that's got to piss you off to be like, he hasn't, he's just got a formula. There's nothing artistic about this. And you could see that kind of eating away at Jesse during that scene where he keeps throwing up the meth. Like, why am I not as good as him? He's not even like, he's not trying basically. Right. And, and because Jesse kind of was, that was the thing that made Jesse special was that, you know, he put cayenne in his, in his meth. And that was, that was different than, you know, the gray shit that people were putting out beforehand. It's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good take on it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, we've talked about the show, but we need to get into some fan fiction. But before <laughs> we do that, I'd like to remind everybody at home that they've, if you're enjoying fun fiction, you can always support us at patreon.com slash a load of BS, the website where you can support us. You get access to our exclusive discord. You get shouted out on the show of your choice every single week, like the Patreon saying of fun fiction, Joe 
Gennaro, ladies and gentlemen. And then, of course, you get access to our exclusive show on Patreon. You paid for this, where we watch really bad movies and commentate over them. We're basically, it's a guided meditation through terrible film. And if you want access to it, you can at patreon.com slash a load of BS. Now, Bryce, Hmm. I just... I feel so bad for what I brought to the table for my fan fiction this week. Because you were telling me it was bonkers, which well, I feel like I, I don't know what? how many of these you've, you've done before, but you have to you must understand that fan fiction spans the gamut. It's the entire oh, yeah. range of. Well, the one I wrote for segment three is bonkers. This one was actually submitted through a Reddit thread I posted a while back about, hey, do you want something read on a podcast? And they submitted this, and I'm like, I doubt I'll ever watch Breaking Bad. And then I ended up doing it. So <gasps> they wrote, so someone wrote this for the show. Well, it, y- yes and no. Like, <sighs> basically, they brought this to the table saying, hey, could you read this on the show? And I went, yeah, yeah. So this is a crossover, but I will not reveal what it's crossed over with yet. Okay. Um, and it takes place. I actually, I feel bad because you were trying so hard not to spoil anything in the last one, and this is spoiling stuff for me because this <gasps> takes place. This takes place after episode one of season four, after a box cutter. Oh, geez, yeah, a lot of stuff yeah. happens in that time. I hope this <laughs> fin fiction makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and in three, two. Jesse knows he's not asleep. Not even halfway. Not after so much coffee, it feels like a bump of his own blue. Not after the events of the last two days. Everything perfectly normal. He shuffles past a sea of silent brown faces, pretending to ignore each other as you open the secret James Bond door to the underground. Mumble, yeah, I've got no idea what any of this means. Mumble (laughs) at Cancer Man, receive a grunt in return, might as well be another wage sucker punching a time clock. Just another morning, just like any other. The day after you've watched your boss empty a man's life out in front of you. That shit'll wake the dead. Except here he is, ready to pinch himself because Mr. White's wearing his biohazard suit. But it's not even zipped up, sitting at one of the desks, sitting at one of the desks as he frantically scribbles in a notebook. And something that looks like a bunch of tin cans held together through mere magnetism and sheer force of will is flying around the lab like the love child of Speed Racer and Speedy Gonzalez, literally bouncing off the walls. He descends the metal staircase like he's diving into maple syrup, nearly stumbling on the final step as the jumble of metal screams past him. It stops, resolving into a tiny shape. We're baking cakes! It screeches before zooming away once more a blur. Jesse's confusion is only outmatched by disbelief. You built a robot? Mr. White ignores him, feverishly muttering as he continues to scribble. Finally, he stops, staring at the paper in front of him. My God. He looks up at Jesse, not even seeing him. It's perfect. What are you talking about? What's perfect? 100% purity. He says it with such awe and reverence. That kind that's only achievable in theory, never practice. The moment you expose it to air, oxidization, back down to five nines at best. The tin can rolls up to Jesse, craning its tiny neck and fixing him with a blank stare. Hi, cow! What the hell? Bye, cow! The thing shrieks and rolls away. Because it's unstable, you see. The wondrous rapture on his old teacher's face reminds Jesse of those creepy audiences of the Jesus Sunday Power Hour. A trembling finger stabs at the hastily scrawled equations. But this, it maintains integrity right up until the moment of ingestion. I never would have believed it was possible, but there it is. Jesse turns and looks at the bouncing tin can, currently sticking its head into one of the aluminum tanks. (laughs) It shouts. Then it does it again. And again. And again, until Jesse looks away with a growing headache. Look, Mr. White, seriously, this is the new normal. Walt starts to hand him the paper, then changes his mind and grabbing a, grabs a fat, fresh sheet. I'll make a proce- process sheet for us to follow. Just simplify it a bit. Jesse should be offended, but he's too busy looking for hidden cameras. He finally gives up and gets changed. It's harder than usual to keep his mind on the job, and not just because of bloody thoughts. He keeps thinking he sees a shadowy figure on the fringes of his vision, but it vanishes every time before he can get a bead on it. He knows he's not asleep or high, and he's starting to wish for either or both. This is paranoia without the fun. 
Walt's muttering at him from across the table, but Jesse barely registers, too busy staring at their finished product, as clear as the sky, dark as the deep blue sea. It makes that first batch they made in the RV look like scum from a bathtub reject. His mouth is actually watering, and he has to swallow to keep from drooling. Knowing his partner is watching his every move as they break it up and shovel it, shovel it into Tupperware crates. He doesn't want it anyway, old habit talking. They're washed up and back in street clothes before he could find the nerve to speak. Hey, uh, Mr. White. Walt blinks and focuses on him, looking almost normal, whatever that is. Yeah? Are you... He nearly laughs it off. Are you okay? No, Jesse. Walt's voice is gentle, his gaze one of pity. I have cancer. I'll never see my daughter grow up. My wife left me when she found out I manufacture substances of mass destruction, and I was indir indirectly responsible for... He blinks and cocks his head like a pondering bird. For the death of hundreds of people. <laughs> hey, you said that wasn't on us. <laughs> Jesse knows he should... <laughs> Jesse knows he should be you glad to hear this. You don't know what that means. Oh, I got a feeling. Like, <laughs> if you told me at this point in the show that he hadn't been indirectly responsible for a lot of death, I'd be like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you said that wasn't on us. Jesse knows he should be glad to hear this, and yet it's all he can do to keep from grabbing Walt and trying to shake some sense into him. And he's not even talking nonsense yet. Look, I said a lot of things. Walt shrugs. It's obvious the cancer has gone to my brain, and I'm quite insane, so I'm just gonna... He makes a vague gesture with one hand. Roll with it. That didn't take long. Y but I see it, too. Jesse hates the whiny pleading in his voice. Try as he might, he can't stop caring. You're not crazy. Oh? A fraction of the old condescending sneer makes his presence felt. So now you have a degree in psychiatry? Look, I don't need a degree in psychology to see a freaking robot flying around our lab, Jesse insists. Or this impossible batch of blue we just cooked up. Look, I know you're smart, but, dude, there's no way you came up with this on your own. Walt's eyes narrow to slits, and he grabs his coat, hiding up, heading up the staircase two at a time, rattling metal with each indignant stomp. At the door, he stops, hand on the knob, not looking back. Just do your job. The door slams, and Jesse stands there for far too long before feeling a tug on his pant leg. Hey, naughty, naughty, hey! He looks down to see the tin can holding an inflatable toy in its tiny, upraised fist. Is that a... The can bounces again, its high-pitched voice full of pride and excitement. It's my moose! Yeah, right. Jesse looks around the room again, then back down. The thing stares up at him with blank, hopeful eyes. You got any treats? <gasps> oh! Hey, hey, that was my last bag. I want toast. You do? I, uh, I think I got some bread. And a snake, and a wombat, and a train, and a gold razor with a slice of lemon, and a... Jesus Christ, will you shut the fuck up? Okay. Okay, jeez. Look, Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, have some fucking toast already. Crunch, crunch, you're better than my master. You're tall. Not exactly sure how I feel about that. What's that? Uh, that's a Roomba. It's like a vacuum... Hey, wait a minute. Oh, oh, God, oh, God! I like this good! The new normal doesn't even last two days before Jesse comes in to find... Gurr duct-taped to a chair. Walt's Whoa! pacing... <laughs> no! Walt's pacing around his captive, trembling excitement transformed into rage. My wife is in hysterics because you couldn't keep your hands to yourself. Poking the baby. Gurr kicks his legs, but only succeeds in tipping the chair over. Jesse winces at the hollow clang of the robot's head bouncing off the cement floor. I don't care what you call it. Walt supplies extra emphasis by grinding his heel into the side of Gurr's head. You tell your master that my family is off limits, understood? There is no need to tell Zim! The spidery form clings in the corner of the ceiling like a bat. Red eyes blink, realizing that Walt and Jesse are both staring back. Anything... It concludes, the majestic pronouncement somehow deflated. Jesse, Walt sighs. Meet the source of our new recipe. He comes in the next morning having no idea what to expect. The air filtration unit is gone, replaced with a throbbing, misshapen lump of metal that shines under the fluorescent like wet under fluorescent like wet flesh. As for the generator, their lab is apparently now running off a fleet of nuclear powered hamsters. I grow weary of this dismal facility. 
A coffee mug narrowly misses Walt's head and shatters against the far wall. When will Zim be free to reap the rewards of his labor? To march upon the conquered hordes of filthy, stinking earth buds and make them cower like the vermin they are! You're not going anywhere until I'm satisfied. Walt glares at the alien for only a moment before returning his attention to the open notebook before him. The last thing we need is for my brother-in-law to see you and start connecting little green man theories. Zim is not a man. Look, give it a rest, Walt mutters. Zim is Zim. And Zim, Walt emphasizes, is not my boss. I answer to one man and I don't care what you show me. Gus Fring is a hell of a lot scarier than you. Zim's eyes narrow, utterly flat and devoid of pupil. Tell me more of this Gus Fring. Jesse knows, knows he looks dubious. Are you sure about this? Oh, please. Walt's not even looking, his greedy eyes focused on the mountains of cash in front of him. You really think anyone's going to notice? Gus grins like a jovial serial killer and sticks out his hand. Welcome home, son. Darned robo-parent programming? Zim growls, giving the remote control a hearty smack. Can't seem to erase it. As long as you're sure the real one's been dealt with. Walt glances over at Zim and a trace of doubt enters his voice. Because otherwise... Zim is the supreme crime lord! The alien puffs out his chest and straightens his back with little effect on his bearing and none whatsoever on his height. Yeah, hooray for you. Jesse tries and fails to keep the gloom away. Have fun with the cartel. The brain of Gus Fring now resides in the body of a common darter snail. This cartel, too, will face Urkin with wrath and crumble before it like... A dry and crumbly cookie! All will kneel before... The alien runs out of breath and engages in a fit of dry and unproductive coughing, eventually squeaking out a final syllable. Sim! Where's it stop? Jesse wonders. Pickles! Gers shouts and throws his arms around Jesse's leg, gazing up in rapt adoration. Well, he supposes. Things could be worse. At least he had a friend. The end. Holy shit, dude. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I'm... Oh. That is very, very good. There was a journey back. <laughs> oh, and you did all... You did such good character voices. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Oh my god. The moment I said Gur, I was like, am I about to have to take a pause and just let him get this out? I mean, I was I was losing it. Yeah. The entire time after you said Gur the first time. Oh Jesus Christ. So, so oh wow. That's I don't I don't I, what I have is good. My what I have you- might get you horny, but this is not gonna compare at all. <laughs> Okay, so are we just going to put a quick smut warning on this episode? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. On that one. Uh, I, because I didn't, I didn't, my only interaction with fan fiction is generally for explicit material. Okay. I can, I can find you some, 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 some cutesy BS. I can, I had a second one that is not, um, well, I, I, don't know that they say cock in this one but <laughs> <laughs> we're learning a lot about bryce on this episode well so uh so was, should i just read this off is is that what uh yeah dude bring it to the table all right Let's get this, horny <laughs> this is called uh didn't know i needed this from cali underscore se from archive of our own dot org jesse are you there it's walt Walt looks around, then peers in through the glass. He's already seen the car is in the yard, but there doesn't look to be anybody home. After a couple more taps at the door and several unanswered phone calls, Walt decides to get in through a side window that's been left open. It's big enough to fit through without a struggle, and a few moments later, not quite sure what he'll find, a burglar, a dealer, a customer, Jesse left for dead, and by any one of the above, Walt makes his way into the house. Jesse's jacket is on the chair, and his shoes have been kicked off by the sofa. "'Where the hell is he?' Walt says aloud." Going through the kitchen, he sees Jesse's phone and cigarettes have been left on the counter. Asleep, he thinks. Of course. That's where I'll be, passed out on his bed. I mean, at this time of day, where else? Just to be sure, Walt makes his way upstairs to Jesse's bedroom. Finding the door ajar, he peeps in. 
Sure enough, Jesse is on the bed, but he's not asleep. Not even close. The afternoon sunlight is seeping through the curtains, casting a soft glow across the room and onto Jesse's face. His eyes are closed. His head is pressed against the pillow and his lips are parted. T-shirt pushed up and pants and underwear shoved down. He's working his cock with deft, eager strokes. He bites his lower lip as he speeds up the pace. (laughs) (laughs) Walt watches from his vantage point, telling himself he's seen enough already, that he really should leave now while remaining silently rooted to the spot. He tries to swallow, but his mouth is dust dry as he takes in the sight. He's transfixed, unable to look away, because Jesse is beautiful, luminous, utterlessly lost in the moment. Jesse's limbs grow taut as he nears his orgasm. He keeps his eyes firmly closed, concentrating only on getting himself off. Then suddenly, he makes a sound somewhere between a moan and a sob, and he's there. It's quite possibly the sexiest thing Walt has ever seen. So this is about the point where I kind of had okay that breakthrough moment of like oh yeah i've never really looked at these characters like this but this kind of works yeah kinda. Uh, kinda all right there, there's there's some more here there's a there's a there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a second half to this here we go. uh walt is a little dizzy and undeniably aroused has he absolutely no idea i'm here he thinks to himself as jesse comes back down to earth the thought breaks walt's silence and his cover as a small sound escapes his unbidden uh as a small sound escapes unbidden from deep within him. He moves back, but it's too late. He hits the doorframe with his hand in his haste, making an even louder noise. Jesse looks sharply in his direction, then closes his eyes and mouths. What the fuck? Mr. White, he says. I know you're there. Shoes over, yo. I'm sorry, Jesse, Walt says. I had no idea you'd be... uh, I'm leaving, okay? Jesse says something as Walt makes his way downstairs and out the door, but he doesn't quite catch it and doesn't like to take a guess at what it was. What a dumb, dumb thing to do. Jesse Pinkman, of all people. Walt gets back in his car, bangs the door a little too hard, then leans back in the seat and shuts his eyes. He can still see Jesse's face, still hear him. Walt, stop it, he admonishes himself. Stop it now. This is totally ridiculous. He's just getting ready to start out the car when his cell phone rings. He knows it's Jesse without even looking. After hesitating for a moment, he answers. Yes, How long were you standing there? Jesse asks, after a moment or two of silence. Long enough. So, so you saw pretty much everything, Jesse. Yes. You broke into my house. The window was open. Okay, you climbed into my house and you spied on me. That's what you're saying, right? Well, I think spying was a little much. I don't. So did it turn you on? Oh, God. No, Jesse. Not in the least bit. No? Walt can't help but notice the disappointment in Jesse's tone. Not at all. Jesse, I don't wish to discuss this. I'm hanging up the phone now. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Walt clicks his phone off and starts to drive, not quite sure where he's headed. He can't go home, not yet. He parks up in a secluded spot and attempts to get his head around the situation. So, he stumbled on Jesse doing that. He didn't leave. Instead, he watched. But what's the big deal here? He was curious, right? Natural enough. It was the surprise, the shock that made him stay rooted to the spot. Walt sighs. No, he watched because he wanted to. Because it was Jesse because he liked it not sure if he should but doing it anyway walt throws more caution to the wind grabs his phone and dials jesse picks up almost immediately mr white yes jesse walt says the answer to your question is yes it turned me on okay i watched you because i liked it because it was hot because you were hot there is silence for a few moments walt closes his eyes shakes his head oh god no stupid 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 so are you coming back to my house or not jesse says Walt doesn't need to be asked a second time. He's already halfway there. All he needs to do now is remember how to drive. So. Oh, okay. So. (laughs) Part of me wants to like, because we used to have a big no smut rule with my previous co This is what I meant when I asked if there were guidelines. This is what I meant when I asked no, about guidelines. No, I much prefer my idea, which is I'm going to release two versions. Ah. Maybe one will, maybe one will be a Patreon exclusive of Jesus. the Bryce Castillo cut, smut cut. Christ. And then the other one, I'm just going to go through like a movie on TNT and dub in just like, Jesse was playing Mario Kart. <laughs> Jesse oh, Jesus. was doing a game. Well, so. I mean, I'm horny, so I mean, we're good. <laughs> but it was it. Uh, so looking for this and for uh, for a fiction for this uh, this show, I, I you know was 
was just weird. You know, I don't think of Breaking Bad in this way. I don't think of the characters of Breaking Bad in this way. Clearly, a lot of people do. Yeah, that's the weird thing is just the sheer amount of different ships you can find through fan fiction. I'm like, no, I'm good. Why? Mm -hmm. Like, there are some obvious ships. Like, Captain Marvel, I was like, Carol Danvers and, um, oh, God, what's her name? Her uh, oh, partner. Yeah, her, her friend, her Earth friend. Yeah, her Earth friend. I was like, oh, no, I ship that almost immediately. But the Internet's just like, the fucking cat and Nick Fury, let's go. And I'm like, okay, oh. Internet. That's Calm a good down. shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the the big one that I saw a lot of for Breaking Bad was, um, oh man, was Mike in season one? I don't think Mike Ehrmantraut is even in season one. But I don't uh, know. If he, I don't think he is. There, there's a private investigator named Mike Ehrmantraut who becomes a big part of the story. I think in season two, and they ship him with Jesse. And it's um, if you think the Jesse Walt dynamic is weird, uh, is, is imbalanced yeah. physically. The uh, Jesse Mike Urban Trout relationship is even mm -hmm. more unbalanced. I feel like the only reason I'm approving that smut is just like <laughs> it is just just the sheer amount of how much daddy material Jesse is in the first season. Like each time he came on screen, I was just like, "Oh, okay, oh yeah, you do what you need to, baby boy. It's fine. <laughs> Let's go." My partner's looking over at me. She's like, what are you doing? Nothing. Don't worry about it. This is, <laughs> this is, a, this is a Pinkman time. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, it's... I'm sweating. I'm going to have to change shirts. I can't go out like this. <laughs> this is... I've been, I, I apparently... Uh, I was... I was... I, uh, I feel embarrassed now. <laughs> I saw you dabbing with that towel, and I was so... I was like, oh, okay. Uh, but let's get into my fic. But before we Please do don't. that... If uh, people don't want to donate on Patreon and prefer something more physical, they can always go to merch.aloadedpurebs.com, pick up some fun fiction merch, including the fun fiction, it's weird, or fan fiction, it's weird in private shirt, which is the most applicable to this episode, I think. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, there's shirts and merch for all the other BS Network programs that you can get at merch.aloadedpurebs.com. That's merch.aloadedpurebs.com. Com. Now, for my fan fiction this week, I decided, like, the fan fiction I usually really like is stuff that's almost like that Lion King one and a half thing, where it's, this is happening at the same time, but I, I'm not usually a big fan of transformative fan fiction, where they just take the story and change it, because sometimes they can get it so off the rails. Yeah. But that's exactly what I did with my fan fiction this week because I've been watching another show in addition to Breaking Bad and it's influencing my life in many major ways. And I just decided, well, what if that but Breaking Bad? So I won't I won't spoil it. So okay. let's just get in let's get into reading. Cancer. These words fell out of Walter White's mouth with the weight of a tank in space. The gravity simply hadn't set in yet. His eyes darted from knick-knack to photo on the desk of the doctor in front of him, desperately vying for some sort of distraction from this fact. He had never really gotten a choice at anything in his life, and the fact that he didn't choose how he was going to end that life, well, it destroyed him. Destroyed him faster than the uh, Adena carcinoma currently taking up residence in his lungs. He tried to ignore it. He tried to hide it when he went home to his family. He tried to hide it when he went to work, and he prayed that the less credence he gave the diagnosis, the less power it'd have. Unfortunately, cancer isn't Tinkerbell. It exists whether you believe in it or not. You can't just clap your hands and it'll go away. Walt's life had been out of his hands for many years now, but this diagnosis just solidified that fact in his mind. He was not in control. He was not Walter White, just a simulacrum of himself constructed from the thoughts and choices of those around him. All right, class, let's cook. Walter quietly commented to his class, causing them all to raise their eyebrows. His classes at GP Wynn, or J.P. Wynn were his only distraction from the pain that was eating him alive. It was the only place he felt truly in control. What are you waiting for? You've got your ingredients on the table and a recipe right beside you. Now, the recipe you see on the table is for sourdough bread, an extremely simple bread to start out your cooking journeys with. Walt dug through his cabinets at his home economics class as the students started to lazily mix together their supplies. He returns to his desk with a loud thunk, placing a jar on the table. But you see, 
A good sourdough is only as good as its starter. And this starter has been helping my class make bread for years. Has the influence of class after class, person after person. It is a beautiful, swirling vortex of living history that you get to add to with your breads today. Walt spoke with conviction when he taught. Home economics was the one thing he truly knew, and he was damn good at it. He could cook, he could clean, and most importantly, he could sew. It may have led to a few jeers from the jocks in the class, but Walt truly believed in the skills that home economics provided. That if you knew how to cook for yourself, how to clean for yourself, how to make and repair your own clothing, the world was your oyster. Unfortunately for Walt, that thought process didn't lead him far in life. His pride was, like many before him, his downfall. He had had numerous opportunities in the past to utilize his skills. He could have been the top garment designer for numerous companies. He could have baked in the best kitchens in the world. Walter's White, Walter White's life was truly his oyster. But his pride betrayed him. He wouldn't take jobs because they wouldn't pay enough for his skills. They didn't truly showcase his abilities. Excuse after excuse poured from his lips because not only was he amazing at what he did, he also knew it. Hey, you awake back there, Walty? A voice jostles him from his thoughts, and Walter realizes that he's in a police cruiser. After a moment of panic, he re re remembers why. His brother-in-law, Hank, offered to take him out on a routine ride-along throughout the city. He told Walt that it was just a bonding experience for the two, but Walt knew the truth. It was another one of Hank's attempts to force Walt to man up. It was basically his M.O. whenever they were around one another. He considered Walt's career to not be befitting of a man of Walt's stature. He considered it a joke. He considered it, by his own admission, to be girly. We've got a 1031 down at Soul Flu Food, a voice called across Hank's scanner, and he immediately stepped on the gas, crossing through an intersection and nearly causing a massive wreck. Walt strapped on his seatbelt as Hank took the comm with a smile. Yeah, we're on our way. Strap in, Walt. Looks like you're going to see something good today, baby. And with that, the car barreled towards the Soul Food Footwear, New Mexico's number one combination footwear and barbecue restaurant. By the time they arrived, numerous police cars were surrounding the building with roughly four men being held up, massive bags of heels at their feet. Damn, that's a lot of shoes, huh, Walt? What exactly good would come from stealing shoes. Walt questions as he sees the cops removing brand new expensive pumps from one of the bags. Look, do you know how much those bad boys would fetch on the black market? That's easily 15 grand a bag. This sentence caused Walt's eyes to widen as he stares at those four bags. One of the cops turns around one of the men and immediately begins to cuff him, causing Hank to quickly unbuckle and jump out of the car. Hey, hey don't start the party without me. <laughs> hey, Walt, you stay here and I'll check things out. With that, Hank left the car, and Walt was left alone with his thoughts once again. His back ached as it pressed against the hard plastic of the back seats. He tried not to think about Hank's tales about all the drunks who had vomited back there and passed out, or all the times that Hank praised those plastic seats for being so easy to wash off with a hose. Walt swore he caught a whiff of aged vomit and immediately went into a coughing fit during which he caught a glance into the back alley where a young man was slowly making his way out of the back door of Soul Food with a massive bag of shoes in his hand. Walt's eyes widen as he notices the face of the man carrying those shoes, and he groans, head falling into his hands. Pinkman. Roughly two hours later, the man known as Jesse Pinkman quickly pulled up to his home and hid his car from view before pulling out the massive bag from his back seat. He quickly rushes through each individual shoe, praying that he had gra grabbed its mate before slinging the bag over his shoulder, preparing to enter his home. Suddenly, the sound of rustling leaves alerts him to the fact that he is not alone. Jesse quickly dives behind his car, reeling in the bag of heels closer to him. Hey, this is private property. Get out of here. Jesse yells in an attempt to get the intruder to leave, but to no avail. Footsteps continue closer and closer as a bead of sweat forms on Jesse's brow. Hey, what are you, fucking deaf or something? I said this is private property, yo. Well, so was that. A voice calls from behind him as it places a boot against the bag, pinning it to the ground. Jesse wasn't sure he was expecting to be on the other side of the boot, whether it be law enforcement, an angry shoe store manager, but the one person he damn sure didn't expect was his high school home ec teacher. Nice to see you're doing well for yourself, Jesse. Mr. White? 
Yo, what the hell are you doing here? I graduated a long time ago, and you ain't got no business coming in my yard to give me some come-to-Jesus meeting about going clean, okay? That's not why I'm here, Jesse. Oh, okay, let me guess. You want me to return this shit or something? Look, no way, man. They're charging $500 for a pair of pumps in that place. If anyone's a robber, it's them. And let me guess. You were only going to sell them for, what, 250 What? You think I'm selling these things? With this statement, Walt seemed taken aback. You honest to God think there's some dark, deep black market out there for these dumb fucking heels with juicy written across the sole? Wait, then why are you stealing them? This question from Walt seems to freeze Jesse in his tracks. The young man ignores it as he quickly stands and walks over to his garage door, lifting it and tossing the bag of shoes underneath before quickly slamming it back down. Okay, look, I don't know why you're here, and to be frank, I don't give a shit anymore, yo. Just get off my lawn and go back to your cribbage class or whatever it is you usually do on a Wednesday night, okay? What's in the garage? Look, what's in the garage is my own personal business and none of yours. So if you could kindly just... And with a quick move, Walt charges past Jesse and lifts up the door to reveal the most violently pink room that Walt had ever seen in his life. A large dressing room mirror decorates the side wall as old racks containing dilapidated dresses sit in every corner. Walt's eyes struggle to take in everything at once as he passes pa- pushes past Jesse to take a look inside where he discovers a large poster. The Pink Lady. Now performing at the Double Helix, Walt reads the words of the poster out loud as he surveys the woman on the poster before taking a long, hard look at their face. Is that... Pinkman, is that you? What? No, 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 dog. That's, 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 that's not me. Jesse attempts to argue as Walt continues to survey his surroundings to see more posters of Jesse operating under the name of the Pink Lady. It seemed every venue in their Tri-County area had been graced by the Pink Lady's presence. Well, you certainly get around, don't you? Walt continues before a small smirk grows on his lips. That smirk grows until he begins openly guffawing at everything around him. Jesse holds back a hurt look on his face as Walt's laughing fit is interrupted by coughing, causing him to sit in Jesse's makeup chair. Look, I'm sorry, it's just... Jesse Pinkman, the kid that used to call my students homos and shove them in the lockers, he's now the pink lady. Quite a turnaround you've had. Yeah, yeah, it's a real fucking redemption story, isn't it? Now could you kindly get out of my makeup chair and get the fuck off my property? So, why steal the shoes, hmm? Seems like you're making good money doing shows every weekend. Why steal? Okay, look, did you not hear me earlier? In this world, you gotta spend money to make money. If you don't look like everything on you is custom made or cost a thousand dollars, there's no point. And those club owners don't care that you've got a house payment to make or bills to pay or a family to feed. They want to see you come back in something new with a whole new show every single weekend. Look, you and I both know no normal person can afford that, Mr. White. Then why not make your own? Walt asks while running his fingers through an old dress in a pile that Jesse has labeled burnt looks. What? What are you talking about? I'm saying that you don't have to throw away every piece that you've already used. You can tear it up, reuse the fabric, make something new. I mean, you've got a sewing machine right there. Just use it. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I tried that once. Jesse comments as he walks over to a rack, pulling off a horrifying ensemble featuring torn holes all throughout it and misplaced stitches hid by knotted chiffon. And they booed me out of the venue. Do you not see the importance of taking my class now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Mr. White. I'll be sure to take my time machine and tell myself to take home ec to prepare for being a drag queen to pay my fucking rent. Look, let me help you. With these materials, I can make you the most stunning dress you've ever seen. All I ask is for a cut of what you make at the shows. And I'll make everything you could ever dream of. Why are you doing this? Jesse asks with a raised eyebrow, confused as to why Walter White would suddenly try and cut a deal with him. Instead of responding, Walter immediately goes to work, grabbing old matching dresses and cutting them apart with fabric scissors. Hey, those were expensive. And they look like crap. What I make will cost next to nothing and look ten times better than this store-bought bullshit. 
Jesse's eyes widen as Walt makes this proclamation, instead opting to watch the master work as he continued to recycle old pieces of Pinkman's burnt looks pile into a beautiful dress. By the end of two hours, Walt stepped back to look at his piece, a beautiful two-toned dress with pink chiffon dancing around blue silk. Holy shit, Mr. White, you're an artist, yo! It's not art. <laughs> it's just home economics. Thanks, Mr. White! And with that, Jesse grabbed the dress, a matching pair of heels in his makeup case, and rushed out the door, heading to his next gig. Walt laughed as he saw the sheer amount of glee that his work had instilled in Jesse before a coughing fit caused him to back down into the makeup chair. It was at this point that Walt had finally seen his face for the first time in a long time. He had hid from mirrors, hid from himself, but Walt felt that he was ready to be seen once again. He leaned forward and slowly clicked the button that illuminated the numerous round bulbs around the makeup mirror and stared down at the menagerie of makeup before him. He slowly reached forward and grabbed some foundation, slowly applying it to his aged face. Concealer helped hide the bags that he had developed over the years, and he continues that process by filling in his eyebrows and donning some blue eyeshadow. He winces as he, att as he attempts to put on mascara before ending the entire process with an application of blush. He stares at himself in the mirror, and he still seems not quite there, not fully formed. And with that, he looks over to see a bright blue wig that Jesse kept on a shelf and slowly walks over, placing it on his head. The addition of some jewelry from Pinkwin's box made the look complete as Walt returned to the mirror, slowly sitting before it. And for the first time, possibly ever, when Walter White looked in that mirror, Walter White looked back. The true Walter White, the true man, no simulacrum, no falsehoods, no pretending. In that moment, Walt felt free. And he smiled. The end. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man, I've already, like, planned the first season. They end up on RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> like, everything... Walt's drag name would be Crystal Blue Sky. <laughs> like, oh God, that's good. Yeah, man. Like I just I, how, <laughs> so like, how do you how do you even get to that idea of like? I mean, alternate universe fan fiction is very common. Yeah, I don't know where it came from because I, I I came up with the idea before I had even started because I knew the premise of the show. And so I sat down. I was like, well, why don't I watch the first episode and I just rewrite it? But what if instead of making meth, they did something else? Oh, what could they do instead of making meth? And then I just looked and I was watching RuPaul at the time and I was like, hell yes. It's <laughs> It's also just a funny thing to put against it i guess because people are so used to it being that dark show and so i'm like okay take the dark show and the brightest show on television and combine them together when also a very masculine show i mean uh, uh, do you mean breaking bad or RuPaul's breaking bad uh, breaking okay. bad yeah i mean conventionally masculine right like yeah, yeah. that's that's so good that's very good and thank just you <laughs> heart heartwarming i love it Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for joining me for this episode of Fun Fiction, Bryce. Would you have anything to plug to the people out there? Yeah, if you uh, like my voice, um, not reading um, sexually explicit fan fiction, uh, you can find uh, my uh, weekly podcast, Trending Lemon, at TrendingLemon.com. We go over uh, trending news topics and we do online quizzes to figure out uh, a little bit more about each other. So that's at TrendingLemon.com, and you can find me on Twitter at Brycus, B-R-Y-C-A-S. Is that how it's... Pro I've always pronounced it Bryce-ass, and now I'm happy that I know it's not right? <laughs> I don't get a lot of the Bryce-ass. Usually, usually people stumble into Brycus <laughs> just fine. Um... <laughs> I don't get a lot of the Bryce ass is probably my quote of the week. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Scotty Mo S-C-O-T-T-Y-E-M-O. Buy all my books on Amazon. Just look up Scotty Mo and you can find that. And make sure to check out all the other shows online at a load of pure BS dot com and remember to support us through donation buying some merch or more importantly just by leaving a review on itunes we love getting feedback from you guys and make sure to subscribe to the youtube channel because i'm finally going to start reading fan fiction for the channel again so hopefully that'll be out soon but until next time bryce 
let me provide you with a warning that we end every show with. Oh, okay. And that's to stay away from baby Hitler. Blue skidoo, wicked doo. Oh, whoa, whoa.